I want to thank you for being here today. Uh, thank you for taking time from, from your day to learn a little bit about Ferris, about our heritage, about our traditions, about our successes, and about our challenges also. And so this is designed to be interactive. If I'm sharing something or presenting something, and if you have a question, please just raise your hand, and I'd love to answer it while we're there. I'll certainly take questions at the end. Uh, don't feel that you need to take a lot of notes because we're going to post these slides on the web tomorrow and I'll uh, have the sticky notes feature with it. So that'll all be available. I also want to wel welcome the people who are watching us live on, is it YouTube Live that we're doing today, Jason? Thank you. And so if you're tuning in from wherever, we're glad you're here and it's a way that we can extend this to more people than the folks in this room. So here's why we're here. September 1st, 1884, Woodbridge and Helen Ferris started what became Ferris Institute and then Ferris State College and then Ferris State University. And we're so blessed at Ferris to have two founders who were extraordinary men and women of character who really believed in what was the core of a great education and who laid the foundation for who and what we are today. Now, these pictures, these are later in life. Mrs. Ferris passed away in, in 1916. And actually, this picture of Mr. Ferris is taken after Mrs. Ferris's death. Because if you look on his, ring, on his little finger, on his left hand, that's Mrs. Ferris's wedding ring. And the story was that Mrs. Ferris lost it in the garden. And after she passed away, Mr. Ferris and a student were, were killing the garden and they found that ring. Mr. Ferris wore it the rest of his life, which I think is a pretty strong statement since he did remarry. Uh, so, but this is how I want you to think about Mr. and Mrs. Ferris, because they weren't those accomplished, distinguished, experienced, mature people that we see in those first pictures. This is more like what it was when they came here in 1884. And if you can imagine the trip from, from they were in the Midwest, through Grand Rapids, up to Big Rapids by wagon, and to try to create a school in a place that had education. It wasn't that there, wasn't, there weren't schools in Big Rapids, there were good schools, but Mr. Ferris wanted to create a school for people who did not have the opportunity to go to school. So you think about them embarking on this great adventure with their son Carlton, moving to Big Rapids, buying a home, Actually, they were leasing space for the school because the people in town didn't think the school would work and they didn't want to want to be caught in that. This is what we think of as the first class, September 1st, 1884. First thing you notice, 10 men, five women. So from, from day one, this idea of Mr. Ferris had about education for everyone was very much a part of it. And if you look, everyone's in their best clothes but I think you look carefully, you can see that these are people a little bit rough around the edges. And that's because these were people that education had missed. They were either working on a farm, working in a factory, doing, involved in the timber industry, but they had missed education. And we began as an alternative high school. You came to the, Ferris in, came to the Big Rapids Industrial School for 18 months, and you earned the equivalent of a high school degree. Now, obviously 15 people were gonna, weren't gonna put bread on the table for Mr. and Mrs. Ferris for long. But Mr. Ferris was an entrepreneur and he started an evening school. He had 50 students by the end of the first semester, by December, and they never looked back. 1895, Mr. Ferris builds Old Main, just about where our Pracken building is. And when he built on this site, people thought he had moved to the other end of the earth because there was really nothing between downtown and that area except farmland. And Mr. Ferris had sold, had sold shares for this, this school. He lost people's money when the bank went bankrupt. He repaid it all, built this wonderful, wonderful building known as Old Main. So 1899, 1900, this is, you can see the departments we had at Ferris, pharmacy, Shorthand, typewriting, civil service, penmanship, telegraphy. Mr. Ferris really believed that you provide an education to help people create a career. And examples of that is when the telegraph came 
the big rapids, they strung poles and wires up to this building so he could teach telegraphy. He learned how to do stenography so he could teach people how to do that. And always Mrs. Ferris was very involved in teaching. In fact, when she passed away, Mr. Ferris said in, at her wake, if there's a teacher of teachers at the Ferris Institute, it's Helen Gillespie Ferris. You might also look at, in the right-hand side, what $125 will do. 36 weeks living expenses, including board, room, lights, and tuition. So $125 for a year, but $125 was worth far more then. This I want to emphasize and emphasize again. One of the great values we have from our founders is that they believe that education was for everyone. School for all the people, regardless of race, or station, and I'm hoping that last year you took advantage of the opportunity to read, to read Haste to Rise. And if you haven't written, read Haste to Rise, that wonderful book by Dave Pilgrim and Franklin Hughes, I encourage you to do so. It, it's, for me, I couldn't put it down. Once you start to read it, it just, you read this story, you read this next story, and here's all this hidden history, and this heritage of Ferris that we didn't know and that they discovered. Uh, if you haven't received one of these calendars, uh, done by the History Task Force and with, with Franklin Hughes help. This is a wonderful statement to our commitment to diversity and inclusion. And there is so much history contained in this and so much insight. I really encourage you to get one and to put it up on your wall because there's something to learn there. We just, many of us were just downstairs dedicating this wonderful wall of alumni. If you haven't seen this, it's right next to Starbucks. And the stories of these great men and women who went to Ferris and what they accomplished, you know, that's a part of our tradition too. And I think that's a part of our tradition that we need to talk more about. So we celebrate these stories of achievement, but we also set those aspirational goals for our students. So they wanna grow up and be the CEO of GM, or they wanna argue a case before the Supreme Court, or they wanna be a major newspaper publisher or someone who works for, for women's rights. There's just so many great things on this wall. I really encourage you to take some time to read the stories. And when it's not so busy, I'm gonna come back and listen to the stories because I haven't heard that, that yet, but that's also there. Great stories of Ferris. The story of Ferris is also one of challenges. And it's easy to look at a challenge like happened on February 21st, 1950, when Old Main burned to the ground. Certainly a humongous challenge. Uh, and it was a cold night, uh, the hydrants were frozen, they actually stretched hoses down to the Muskegon River, and the Muskegon River is just as far, as far away today as it was then, so you can imagine there was no water pressure, and you can find people who witnessed the, the, the fire at the Ferris Institute at, and saw uh, the steeple go over in that building. But the story here isn't the fire. It's what President Brophy did the next day. This is the board he put in front of the alumni building. And you can read it. The four students are OK. We are receiving prop place for property. Register for classes. Your exams are waived. Ferris Institute will go on. Now, this happened because President Brophy had the insight to say that the school couldn't survive as a proprietary school. And through a long process, ultimately, we became a state institution. Uh, that, the bill was signed in July 1949, and we would become a state institution in July 1950. And so when the fire happened, President Brophy got on the, on the phone with G. Men and Williams, the governor of Michigan, and he said, will you help us rebuild the school? And he said, yes. So he didn't have a task force, he didn't call a committee, he didn't sit around and develop an agenda, he did it. If they'd have stopped and waited, I doubt that we'd be here today. And he did that knowing that he had no place to teach students when they came back in March. And so they, they used the Quonset huts that some students were staying in, they used buildings downtown, they used churches, but the idea the Ferris Institute will go on. If it wasn't for President Brophy, I don't think we'd be sitting here today. So while we thank Mr. and Mrs. Ferris, I think we also thank President Brophy for that. 
All right, so here are some of the challenges we have at Ferris. And no one in this room is, is unaware that we have been challenged by enrollment. And our enrollment will be down again this fall. And over the time, we've had six consecutive years of decline. Those are headcount numbers. And we have to find a way to change this enrollment pattern for Ferris. The reasons for it, certainly, the decline in the number of high school graduates in Michigan, and certainly COVID has had an impact, especially upon students who are at risk or undecided, but we have to change that pattern. We also have a pattern with, with fewer continuing students, and there's fewer students in, fewer students to continue. So it will take some time to reverse this pattern. Here's where we are today. Summer enrollment was down about 7%, SCH was down 10%, but those numbers are small. As of Monday, our headcount was down 7.5%, 7 and 3 quarters, SCH 7.6. We'll do the fourth day count today, and those numbers will be in, in the message that we send out tomorrow. Our preliminary budget was based on a SCH decline of 1.9%, so that decline is more than we budgeted for, so we will have to make adjustments to the budget. We did that on a projected 2% increase from the state, and the state hasn't approved a budget yet. So the good news is the state has plenty of money, uh, over a billion dollar surplus plus the, the federal stimulus funds. But how much of that they will spend on higher education remains to be seen. But I want to talk today about successes. And if you were with us this morning when we did the, the dedication for the virtual learning center, a wonderful, wonderful young woman who's gonna graduate from Ferris, Danae Stoker spoke. And she's a senior graduating in elementary education. And she talked about how the first day she went to GRCC, that she was too scared to get out of her car and go to class. And a Ferris faculty member at GRCC found her, walked her from her car to her class. And if you heard that, that young woman speak today, she was just extraordinary. And that, that, that faculty member was Deb Warwick, who many of you know, re recently retired from, from our Grand Rapids campus. But this is what we do. We change people's lives. That's why we do what we do. We know in the power of education, we know what a Ferris education does for students. And that's why we're here. And that's the difference we make. We'll talk a little bit about COVID. These are the most recent statistics in August. Certainly we've been challenged by COVID, but it's a great success. The way you have worked together, the great work that Janine ward Roof has done leading our reentry committee, and the hundreds of people who have participated in this process to keep us safe. And I think you begin to get an idea of this. 41,300 COVID signs. I didn't know we had that many walls. Uh, 9,000 meals delivered to students in isolation or quarantine. And, you know, I remember that, Janine, because we were, we were doing the pancakes in the spring and the, the, custodian, the, the food service people were helping us at 10 o'clock that night. They were delivering meals at six o'clock the next morning. So people have gone to extraordinary measures to do this. 139,000 masks. Look at this. I, I've been watching the Zoom minutes we're up to 54 million Zoom minutes. You can figure out how many, how many years that is. But that's a lot of Zoom. And you look at the way that we've reached out to students. We've distributed already $15 million in federal funds to our students to help them be able to, to live, to eat, and to go to school. And I know we've been in a lot of Zoom meetings, but did anybody think we were in 97,000 Zoom meetings? This is the work that you've done. It's extraordinary. Maybe it feels like that some days. All right, many of you know about the tuition incentive program. This is, we call this TIP. This is available to students who are Medicaid families. They have to be on Medicaid 18 consecutive months between the time they're in the sixth grade and they're seniors. These are students that Ferris can help because we can help them break that endless cycle of poverty. And so we've made it a concerted effort to reach out to these students, we've more than doubled the number of TIP students at Ferris. So why is this important for these students? Because the state pays their first two years of tuition at Ferris State University. And then our role is to raise funds 
for the juniors and seniors so they could continue and get a bachelor's degree. But you think, think about a young person who's coming from a home that doesn't have a history of going to college. In fact, maybe for some of them, the worst thing they can do is to stay at home because they're getting messages that they shouldn't be going to school. So we bring them here, we help them get an education, we help them become an adult, and we take them from being someone who needs support from someone who's paying taxes and is, is supporting our state. That's what Ferris is about. Last year was some of the best retention in the history of our university. You think about that. In the midst of COVID, in the midst of COVID, where all those things were to encourage students not to come to school, 79% of our freshmen came back as sophomores. That's absolutely extraordinary. The second highest in the history of our school. And even more than that, last year was historically the highest six-year graduation rate in the history of Ferris, Ferris State University. In 2003, that number was 37%. You think about the difference that means about the success of our education. Because the object isn't to go to college, it's to graduate from college. That's how you get the success of it. And this is your work, helping students, helping them find their way, giving them that extra support so that they can be successful. This is another story about Ferris because our education isn't an opportunity if it's not affordable. And we've worked very, very hard to keep a Ferris State University education affordable. So net price. Net price is the difference between everything a student pays. That's tuition, room and board, transportation, books, expenses, everything. That's the total end cost. And then you subtract from that it's scholarships and financial aid, but not loans. And that difference, that's the average price a student go, pays to go to school. That's a national statistic. Everybody who accepts financial aid from the feds has it on their, on their website. And this is our experience over the last decade. And I've broken this out in terms of income level. So if a student comes from a very poor family, their net price has gone down 43.6% over the last decade. You can see 30 to 48, it's gone down almost 30%, almost 17%, 48 to 75,000. The average net price for a fair student has gone down 9% in the last decade. And the reason I point that out, because that is not the case in Michigan. The Michigan Public University average is an increase of 17.3% over that time. So the difference there is 26 plus percent in terms of our affordability for students. And I can tell you, in the Michigan Public University, the only university in the state that has a negative net price over the last decade is Ferris State University. Why is it? We constrain costs. We invest in financial aid, and we've raised money for scholarships. So this is your success, and we did this because we were concerned about student debt. This is the highest number you ever see for student debt, because this is only students who start at Ferris, end at Ferris, and have debt. And if you can see, since 2010, the average student, student debt at Ferris has gone down. You think about inflation during that time, you think about the, the, the price challenges in maintaining an institution, and to go down in terms of student debt is a remarkable achievement. And that's something you all have worked for because we had the sacrifice to do that, and we've worked hard to educate our students about being financially smart in the choices they make. We're gonna talk about fundraising because this is another great story at Ferris. This is our now and always campaign. You may recall we started off to raise $80 million, and we raised $80 million, so then we set off to raise $115 million, and these numbers are actually out of date. Our, our total right now is $111,300,000, and so we're headed towards that goal of $115 million, and we're gonna make that in the next couple months. And for an institution that never had a comprehensive campaign to raise that kind of money for our students and our programs is truly remarkable. Thank you for your work on that. Last year, we spent years preparing for our accreditation visit by the Higher Learning Commission. And then, as it was coming up, everything went virtual. In fact, I believe we were one of the first schools in the country that had a virtual review. And we went through your great work, no follow-up visits, no follow-up reports, and this is the second decade. We 
It did the same in 2011, 2020. The Harlan Commission gave us a complete, clean bill of health. And this is the first time this has ever happened in the history of our institution. It shows and affirms the quality of our education. <laughs> Last thing we worked really hard on the campus master plan. Uh, if you want to read this, it's a, it's a living document about the future of our institution. Just go to the, the web page and type in campus master plan. It'll go right to that page. But many people contributed to this. And if you think about our institution, you know, we're sitting where the Rankin Center used to be, right? With the dome room. How many people remember the dome room? All right. Uh, this is better. <laughs> and at one time, out there where the quad is, there was a road and a parking lot there. In fact, there was a road out there and two residence halls out there, right? So we have worked really hard to make our campus, our university, a place that's green, that's welcoming, that supports teaching and learning at our institution. We're fortunate at first to have a fabulous strategic plan. This is more vibrant than any strategic plan I've seen at a, at a public university. You can find this by just typing in university strategic plan. We're working hard on this making great progress, and it's a great guide map for us moving forward. Earlier today, we dedicated our virtual learning center, new $32 million building done in 2023. With that building, the state has invested $80 million in facilities at Ferris State University. And there's a tendency for us to look at the things the state doesn't do, but we need to give the state credit when they do the support for us. And that's over $100 million in, in construction here and in Grand Rapids. This is going to be fabulous. This is actually the view facing towards the quad. You can see the, the flight, building the flight poles just on the right. We'll also begin work on a much needed expansion and renovation of the Ava Globe and Sports, Sports Center. And this began as a project to build a new strength and conditioning facility. And many of you have seen those diagrams. They were fabulous. What we are building is far better because this really meets the need of Ferris ath Athletics. That gold area on the, on the view there, that's gonna be a brand new arena for women's volleyball. And if you think about the gold standard that our volleyball women set for Ferris, you know, like 16, 16 consecutive years in the NCAAs, but when we host the NCAAs, they have to go up and play in the basketball gym because our space isn't big enough. And, if you've been to one of those, those, those games for the NCAA in the gym, for some unknown reason, if the ball hits the ceiling or anything extending from it, it's still in play. I can't figure it out, but it, it's, that's the way it is. So we're gonna build a great place for our volleyball athletes, and then we're gonna take their arena, and that's gonna be our strength and conditioning facility. And then we're going to redo all the locker rooms, all the support facilities for all the athletes in there that haven't been redone up to this point. And if you've walked through the sports arena, you know that you have to walk through the ice arena to get to the rubber room or the current volleyball arena. We're gonna fix that also because the athletics ought to have a hallway that gets to the back of their building, I would think. So we're excited about this. We're gonna break ground on this a little bit. It's $15.3 million. It's a big investment, but it's long overdue knowing the standard of excellence that our athletes set. And then our latest project is we've had a real challenge with the space for IT employees. They're, they're in the West Building, and the West Building is very tired. And so this summer we made the decision to renovate the Alumni Building. It's a $12.3 million project, and we're gonna move all the IT folks into the Alumni Building. In the way, in doing that, we will have renovated the, the most historic building at Ferris. We've eliminated a ton of deferred maintenance, and we're gonna tear West Building down. So that project should be starting if not this fall, in the spring. But we've done a lot of work the last couple of days, and I wanna thank Shelly Armstrong and her team for the pieces they've done on branding, the pieces around the virtual learning site, the pieces around the stadium, the new banners, and the wrap on the front of the Timmy building, which is all remarkable. We have a fabulous slogan with Ferris Ford and we have a great brand campaign going on. And so we're gonna to continue to emphasize that campaign and that's gonna be at the center of who we are at Ferris about the forward notion of the degree we provide. Now here's some of the strategic decisions that we're working on right now. 
We're working on COVID-19. We're working on that every single day because I think the thing we've learned is that this continually changes. Every couple of months, whatever you knew isn't, 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 isn't applicable anymore. And so we will adjust, we will adapt, we will do more than survive this. We're gonna thrive through this because we're giving our students the education they want and need. We're gonna continue to target our enrollment efforts. We have, we have pockets where we can do much, much better than we have done. We're beginning a new project this year where we're gonna look at achievement gaps. And this is the difference in persistence and attainment of students of color and our entire student body. This is a challenge at Ferris, and it's a challenge that we're gonna conquer. We're gonna eliminate achievement gaps for all our students. We have a major program that's gonna be involved with that. It's themed around student success, and it's about doing inclusive advising. It's, do, it's doing intrusive advising. It's getting the students, to help them with the things they need before they know they need it. And we believe if we can do this in a way, we can change our persistence, our retention, and our graduation. The story of Ferris is the story of new academic programs. I started in 2003. In that time, faculty at Ferris State University have developed 57 new academic degrees, if you can imagine that. No college in the, or university in the country does that. So if you think of us as having 170 degrees, over a third of those are brand new. And that doesn't count all the degrees that have been redone, the courses have been redone. But when we have a new academic program, we have something else that we can offer students and attract them here. And I've already talked about branding and marketing. I wanna thank you. Last year and this year are some of the most challenging things I've ever experienced in higher ed. And I don't think I understood how much I appreciated the community of higher education until I was working out of my basement. Uh, and being able to be around you being able to be around our students. That's really why we're here. So I wanna thank you for the work you do. I wanna thank you for everything you do for Ferris. And I'm willing to answer a question or two if you have some, but if you don't have any, then we're just gonna to go to lunch. So with, oh, there's some questions. Some, somebody asked me a question. Yes, Russ. I know, that was Russ Visner, who's a, an alumnus of Ferris and a member of our alumni board. And the question he said, with the things that have changed in terms of COVID, especially with the Delta virus, how do, how do, you, think you, how do you think you are? Well, first, we're really emphasizing vac vaccinations. Uh, everybody here is masked, and we're gonna continue to mask, because when we mask, it not only protects me, but it protects you. And uh, you know, I've walking around today, our students are doing this too. I mean, people are really a part of that, and that's a major piece. Uh, I think, Russ, one of the things that's been a success for us all along has been wastewater testing. And so we, we have the ability, and actually our students do this for us now, that we can, we can capture waste as it leaves our buildings, and we then do a PCR test on the waste, and we can tell whether there's COVID in the building or not. We can tell what strain of COVID is, and we can also tell how much it is. And so that allows us to focus our testing, which we have a vibrant testing. Was it 27,000 tests we had done? 27.4 or something. So we have, we can test, we have the testing capability to test everybody on this campus as often as we want. And so, but random testing doesn't find many people who are positive. But this kind of targeted testing does. So I think that, that's a piece, and then the other piece is we will adjust as we go along. I'm, we'll probably have to isolate and quarantine some students, but we have plenty of space for that. We know how to deal with that. There'll be things that we haven't thought of and that we'll have to adapt to, but we've had great success in considering what the challenges were, taking action, and when we didn't have the right action, then we pivoted and did learn from that and did the right action. But one of the real strengths of our institution has been the fact that we have a pharmacy school. And Ferris pharmacists have been able to help us with testing, with vaccinations, that plus our health professions, and our scientists have really given us a special advantage. Thanks for the question. So I, th I think we're gonna be fine, uh, but we're not gonna rest on our laurels for a second because we're gonna have to adapt and change to keep our people safe, which is what we want. Another question. Well, I wanna thank you for coming.
we have a few minutes before lunch, but we're gonna have lunch at noon. We're also gonna be rededicating Mr. Ferris's statue out in the middle of the quad as we continue with, uh, with, with our wonderful Founders Day Day. Thanks for being here. Have a great day.